Are you ready for the rapture? Yes. Now we say that because we're Christians, you got to say the right answer, right? But are we really? Let me drop this thought before we get started in your head. As a born-again Christian, are you ready for the rapture? Absolutely, Pastor Billy. Okay, well, here's the deal. The rapture is imminent. It can happen today. It can happen before I get done with this message. And for some of us, you're saying, praise God for that. Okay, but listen, I just, give me a break. I haven't got started yet. All right. <laughs> but Christian, when, not if, the rapture happens, do you realize that Jesus Christ will find you doing something? And if that thought right now convicted you, you're not ready. Now, praise God, all born-again Christians go with the rapture, right? Praise God, we are not saved by our works. But my point is, he's going to find you doing something. Don't you want to be found being faithful? So if right now you're backsliding or you're worldly or you're kind of distracted or dare I say even apathetic, today's your day to get back on track and finish strong because the rapture could happen today. Make sure you're ready. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, what in the world are you waiting for? This is not a joke. This is not a game. Seven-year tribulation is basically hell on earth for seven years nonstop. You don't want to be there. Take the way out through Jesus Christ today before it's too late. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much for today. Thank you again for just this great time we came and now we finished uh, singing love songs to you. We thank you for that and expressing our heart to you. May now we express our attention to you. Give us those ears to hear, hearts to obey what you would share with us today from your word, specifically about this wonderful, encouraging message called the blessed hope, the rapture of we, the church. So God, help us to respond, apply. If we need to be corrected, so be it. Help us to get back on track. If there's people here who need to be saved, please save them. Please have mercy on them before it's too late. God, even if, if it, if just whatever you got to do, please save them. Because they do not want to be left behind. As we're going to see shortly. You will. So we pray and ask your blessings upon our study. We ask all this in your wonderful name. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. The purpose of the rapture. We're going to take a look at both sides of that, certainly for the Christian, but we're going to start off with the non-Christian. But before we get into that, we're going to just take it from scratch. What's the basis of the rapture, right? Because there's people out there that would accuse you and I of being escapists. You're a bunch of wimps. You need to buy a big old Jeep with a muffler on top. And you need to go survive, you know, for seven years, the seven-year tribulation, and buy, you know, 50 bags of rice and lime and that and all this stuff. And I got... Did you notice the ministries that preach that the church is in the seven-year tribulation, whether it's halfway, three-quarters, all the way through? Did you notice they have the solution? Survival gear. Now, I'm not against survival gear if you want to. Uh, hello, you're in Hawaii. you got to deal with hurricanes or whatever. But if your whole aspect of storing up stuff is to survive half the seven-year tribulation, three-fourths of it, or all of it, uh, your focus is in the wrong direction. And I'll just tell you this. I had one prophecy teacher. There's big money in this. Why do these people maintain those positions wrongly, I say, that the church is in the seven-year tribulation? That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, why do they do that? Because it's big money. One so-called prophecy ministry that puts the church in the seven-year tribulation made anywhere from 60 to $70 million just on survival gear in one year alone. I think they're financially invested in that position. That's why they maintain it. I don't think you can if you read the Bible. Okay. But they would accuse us of escapism, right? Saying, that, what do you mean? You're not going to be in seven years. Well, let's take a look at that, right? Let's take a look at the rapture itself, the word rapture itself. And this is where some of the skepticism starts. You know, I mean, how many guys heard the people, I don't believe in the rapture because the rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. Have you heard that? Right? Well, newsflash, did you know the word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible? The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. The word millennium does not appear in the Bible. But the Bible teaches that, okay? And the rapture, the word rapture, yeah, okay, the word rapture doesn't occur in the Bible, but we get the word rapture, the English word rapture, from the Latin word raptura, which is a translation of the Greek word harpazo, which means a quick snatching, uh, catching away, which is what God uses to describe the quick snatching, catching away of the church prior to the seven-year tribulation. So yeah, the word rapture isn't there, but it's just a translation of the original Greek word. Now, why did that happen? It's a conspiracy theory. People have, no. It's common sense, right? How many guys speak Koine Greek? Praise God, all none of you. At least you're honest, right? All right, so, so guess what? That's what the New Testament was written in that mentions Harpods of the rapture, and it got translated into the next language that came along that rhymes with Latin. You know why it rhymes with Latin? Because it was Latin. Okay, so anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so how many guys speak Latin? Are you serious? Really? I, you're, you're messing me up. Don't, don't fucking. <laughs> <laughs> No, so we don't speak Latin, right? So then what's in, so it got translated from harpazo to the Latin word that means the same thing, a quick snatch and catch away, rapture. 
All right, so how many guys, we don't speak Latin except for you know who over here, okay? Uh, but, but so what? It changed the what? It changed the English, all right? So, and, with, and that's what rapture goes to rapture. So what's your point? And that you're going to object on, uh, come on, man. That, that's pretty weak, but they do that, okay? But the second thing is not just the word rapture. All right, you got to have a biblical basis for it, right? You know, people, they still accuse us of escapism. You're a bunch of wimps. You know, you need to be a, you know, survivalist like me and all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. Is it even taught in the Bible? Yeah. Okay, and let's take a look at the primary passage. It's not the only one. Okay, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's take a look at where the Bible talks about this event, this snatching, catching away, the rapture, harpazo. Okay, let's take a look there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to read that classic passage there. Now, if you find 2 Thessalonians, what do you do? Hanging left, for those of you wondering right there. Okay, uh, it's on page 1878 in my Bible, if that speeds it up for you. Yes, it's called stalling time, right? I'm getting there. You can't have dead air, apparently. All right, but let's go ahead and stand as we read God's holy word. What does he say about this event called the rapture, the harpazo rapture, or the rapture? Here's what he says this. Brothers, Paul says, we don't want you to be what? Ignorant about those who fall asleep. What's he talking about? The people who are uh, listening to Pastor Billy preach. That's not funny. No, uh, he's talking about what? It's a euphemism for what? The Christians who've already what? Died. That's all he's talking about, right? Okay, he says, you, we don't want to be ignorant about those Christians who've already died or fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of the men who have what? No hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will, not maybe not might, bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep or died in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you we who are what? Still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep or died. Why? Because the Lord himself will come down from heaven, here's the order, with the loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we hear what? Still alive, and our left will be caught up. That's your Greek word, harpazo, where we get the Latin word raptura, which where we get our English word rapture. It's just right there. They'll be caught up, quickly snatched away together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, storm, survive here because you're going to be doomed. You're in the seven-year tribulation. Ah! Oh, I'm sorry, wrong translation. He said, well, encourage one another with these words. You may be seated if you can, okay? But, and by the way, encourage one another with these words, right? If I'm even a nanosecond in the seven-year tribulation. What's so exciting about that? Hey, you having a rough week? Man, it's rough out there. That inflation is going through the roof, man. It's just life. It's horrible. All this stuff that's going on in the world and the government and this and all this. It's the community. And, you, and let me encourage you. You're going into the seven-year tribulation. Oh, thank you for sharing that. That's a little side note. Right? But again, this is where we get the basis of the rapture. We're not escapists. You know, we're trying to, you guys are a bunch of wimps, right? It's because the Bible teaches it, right? And that's not the only passage. Let me give you a couple other ones. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about it. 51 through 52. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not what? All sleep. In other words, die. If you haven't been in that generation with the rapture, but we will what? We're all going to be changed. How fast? Bang! Just like that. In the flash, in the twinkle of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Just like that. Wait till we, if we get that far, the second message. Also, Jesus talked about it here in John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, he says, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, not maybe not might, will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So not just once, not just twice, three different times in the scripture, we have a clear teaching of a quick snatching, catching away, i.e. the rapture of the church in the Bible. We're not making this up. We're not a bunch of wimps. We're not guilty of escapism. It's something to be encouraged about, is the Bible's clear about, okay? In fact, when you put all three of these passages together, you see an absolute, complete, harmonic message. Shocker, because God doesn't contradict himself, right? Okay, let's take a look at that, right? It, all, all of it, Passages dealing with the rapture, it's a comforting word, okay? It's good news, not bad news. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Paul said, encourage one another with these words. Also, you need to be saved to go in the rapture, 
Okay, you got to have a personal faith. Jesus said, trust in God, trust also in me. And Paul says this, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep with him. Also, we can take God as word, right? You don't have to wonder, is it going to happen? Absolutely it will. God doesn't lie. Jesus said, if it were not so, I would have told you, right? Paul said, according to who? The Lord's own word. We're not making this up, right? And it's a promise of what? He's coming back. Okay, he's going to come back and get us. Jesus said, I will, again, not maybe, not might. Okay, I will come back. And Paul says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven. And then we're going to be removed from the earth. Okay, and that's what Jesus said. And to take you to be with me. Where is Jesus? Acts chapter 1, ever since he ascended visibly, by the way, uh, before the disciples into heaven, he's at the right hand of the Father. So that's where we're going to go at the rapture. Bang, just like that, to take us to be with him. And Paul says, we who are still alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. By the way, there's at least 20 differences of the rapture from the second coming. People say, well, he's talking about the second coming. No, he's not. Second coming is at the end of the seven year tribulation. The rapture takes place prior. Okay. And they're two totally different events. You can't say they're one the same. They say, well, you're, you're preaching, you know, more than one second coming. No, I'm not. Okay. Jesus at the rapture does not come to the earth. We go up to be with him. And that's just one of at least 20 differences. You can't say that they're one and the same. And he says, we're going to forever be present with the Lord. Jesus said that you also may be where I am in the state of eternity in heaven. And Paul says, and so we will be with the Lord for a weekend. And for you backsliders getting kicked back out. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, wrong translation. Forever, aren't you glad when you get there, you don't get kicked out? <laughs> Praise God, all three of you and me. Uh, but anyway, that's what we see. But complete harmony, this is why we believe in it. The rapture is real. It's really real, okay? Uh, and if you're a born-again Christian, you're really going to go, okay? That's why we believe in it. Okay, now let's get down to the importance and the purpose of it. And we're going to start off, okay, with taking a look at the importance and the purpose of the rapture for the non-Christian, right? I don't know your heart today, but going to church services doesn't save you any more than a cow sitting in the bar makes you a cow. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be born again. And if you're here on Thursday, the church is flooded with those people. So that's why I always give the gospel because I don't know where you're at. You know, don't take offense or anything, but statistically, there's a lot of people who go to church services that aren't saved. And if you're sitting here and if you're not born again, and you say, "Well, I'm born," again. really? If you're trusting in anything else other than Jesus Christ and His death on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you're not saved. There's a lot of people think it's by going to church services or getting dunked or, again, stacking chairs or being a deacon and a deacon all over the place. right? No, that doesn't save you. So the importance of the rapture, why you need to know about the rapture, I think is pretty self-evident. Because if you don't go in the rapture, i.e., if you don't get saved so you can go in the rapture, then you're going to be left behind. And you don't want to be left behind. Right? Because imagine this scenario, because it's going to happen, folks. This is not hyperbole. This is not embellishment at all. This is going to happen all over the planet just like that. Can you imagine waking up experiencing this scenario because you refuse to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? They wake up one morning only to discover that their family, their Christian family, has totally disappeared. They scramble, they look around, they run into the living room, they turn on the TV. It's like, what in the world's going on? And there they spy a special worldwide global news report declaring that millions of people all over the planet are missing, and not just their family, but literally millions of people simultaneously in the twink of an eye all over the planet. And then to their horror, they realize, oh, no, why? Why didn't I listen to my Christian spouse, my Christian kids, my Christian grandkids? I went to church services. I deeped all over the place, but I never bowed a knee to Jesus Christ. I never. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. In fact, that news broadcast might look something like this. Let's take a look. Breaking news, we are getting last minute reports from all over the world of thousands of people that have just vanished. I repeat, thousands of people from all over the globe have disappeared. The total number of people who have disappeared has not yet been confirmed, but it is expected to be a lot higher than what was initially reported. According to authorities, the numbers are expected to be in the millions. Many flights have been cancelled because of security fears. According to reports, there have been plane crashes all over the world because some pilots simply disappeared mid-flight. Chaos has also spread to the roads where a great number of traffic accidents have been reported. Hospitals have not been able to cope with the number of patients coming in. 
Many parents are in complete despair as their children have also disappeared. Rumors are rife that this could be an alien attack and there are those who believe that Jesus raptured these thousands of people. Witnesses believe to have seen a bright flash followed by a huge thunderous sound and a being like a man in the clouds. Here are some images caught on CCTV cameras. The images you see now are from CCTV cameras all over the world. These images have been analyzed by experts and they are genuine. CCTV footage from parks, shopping centers, parking lots, churches, and traffic monitoring systems are indeed real and frightening. What has perhaps been most alarming is the report of a hospital where nurses have said in shock that all children just vanished. We are receiving images like these non-stop from all over the world. We are yet to hear from heads of state from all over the world who are in shock but have not yet released any statements. Members of various churches are saying that this is the rapture of the church. When asked why they also hadn't disappeared, many cried and regret not having taken Jesus more seriously before. We are closing this news bulletin here, but we'll return with more news as and when it happens. You can laugh, you can scoff all you want, but guess what? That broadcast, something very similar to that, is going to happen all over the world. Could even happen today. The rapture is imminent, folks. And so if you're not saying, what in the world are you waiting for? This is not, this is not a joke. You do not want to be left behind. Jesus said it. I didn't say it. He says, when you're left behind, you're in the seven-year tribulation. And the seven-year tribulation, I didn't say it, he did, is the worst time in the history of mankind, so horrible, that if God didn't shorten the time frame, i.e. keep it to just seven years, the entire human race would be destroyed. You don't want to be there. You wouldn't want your worst enemy there. In fact, speaking of uh, broadcasts, uh, maybe this will be the weather report that those people who are left behind in the seven-year tribulation will be watching as well. Let's take a look at this. Now, we've got some big changes here for the upcoming work week. Starting tomorrow, we're going to have a volcanic eruption right near Charlottesville, and it's going to make things rather toasty across the area. We're going to see lava spill out into central Virginia and make temperatures in Richmond at 350 degrees, Fredericksburg at 345, Charlottesville, the hot spot at 400 not as hot off towards the tidewater. A little bit more comfortable with highs near 100 degrees. The reason why, we're gonna have tidal waves moving in ahead of this, a global superstorm developing off towards the Atlantic Ocean. This thing is headed our way. We could see maybe about one, 200 inches of rainfall, wind gusts up to 1,000 miles an hour. Overnight, it looks calm, but going to the weekend, there'll be some slight changes. Starting Friday, the southeast will see heavy rain and wind speeds topping 700 miles per hour. That'll spot an F5 tornado and tear westward across the southeast all the way to the west coast. Now in the west, temperatures will look to decrease to about 300 degrees below freezing. Yeah, this says an ice sheet has been forming in California. It's be a good time to stock up on food as this extreme weather will compromise the food supply indefinitely. Those along the Canadian border should be on the lookout for zombies. They've been moving southward out of Canada. And Saturday would have been a great day for beachgoers in the east, but looks like the avian flu outbreak and the recent zombie attacks keep it everyone indoors for a while. So don't forget to wear your masks and only drive during the daylight hours if you're driving along the I-95 corridor. Pastor Billy, you're just trying to be funny, Mr. Funny Guy, you Vegas guy. What are you, an entertainer? That's just a but. Now, if you think I'm embellishing on that, I'm not. Crazy searing heat, volcanoes exploding all over the place, massive weather problems, even a drug-induced population acting like a bunch of zombies. That's all mentioned in the seven-year tribulation. In fact, let's take a jet tour. What's going to happen to those people who are left behind right after the rapture of the church? Here's what you're going to experience for seven years nonstop if you even make it to the end. It starts with the seal judgments. That's the first seal, the white horse rider. This guy rides in on a false peace, right? And that's what, you know, those nasty Christians are gone. That restraining influence is gone. Yay, we can finally party and do what we want. We built utopia. And boom, he shows his true colors real fast, all right? With the red horse rider, a global war breaks across the planet. Then here comes a black horse. You have a global famine. And then you got the fourth horse, a global death, one fourth of mankind is killed by the sword, by famine, by plague or pestilence, and by wild beasts, right? And during the famine, did you know that not only people get hungry, but animals get hungry? In fact, turn to somebody and go like this. That's your universal sign for hungry animals, okay, in case you're wondering. All right, that's what we do in Vegas. But anyway, that's right. That's the, can you imagine that? People are literally going to be running for their lives because animals are going to be chasing them down, trying to eat them. 
Oh, we're just getting started, man. Then you got the fifth seal, the altar of soul, a global persecution. Now, people can still get saved in the seven-year tribulation. We see that with at least three different uh, proof texts. We see with the 144,000 male Jewish witnesses. We see that with the two witnesses, Revelation 11. We also see that God declares the eternal gospel with the angel in the book of Revelation as well. But the problem is, why don't you get saved now? Right? And how many of your unsaved Christians or friends say that to us as Christians? Well, okay, if you guys disappear at this rapture thing, then I'll know you're real, and then I'll get saved then. Are you serious? You have any idea what's going to happen when you get left behind? I mean, your head is literally going to be on the chopping block. The, item, uh, the Bible talks about decapitation coming back. And this word here that's used for persecution, it's very graphic. In the Greek, it's svadzo. It literally means just a, a carving, a filleting, like an animal. You're just chopping them up. You don't want to be, you, you won't accept Jesus now when it's relatively easy, but you're going to do it. Come on, man. Don't fool yourself. Get saved now and avoid the whole thing. Amen. But there's going to be a global persecution. The sixth seal, all of a sudden, bang, here comes a global earthquake. The sun turns black. The moon turns blood red. Asteroids start slamming into the earth. Sky recedes, right? Mountains and islands on the whole planet are removed from their places. Not just Hawaii, right? Not just a couple of islands here. Not just in Tokyo. Not just in Southern California. The whole planet, every island, every mountain is that's how big this baby is. And then there's a the global fear of God's wrath, right? How many people say, well, the first half of the seven-year tribulation is Satan's wrath or, or God's wrath. You know, no, it's not. Even the people in the seven-year tribulation says, hide us from what? The wrath of the Lamb. This is coming from Jesus. It starts at the beginning, goes all the way to the end. Right? But they know, and they're trying to, to fight it. Oh, oh, by the way, you're just getting started. Now we got the trumpet judgments, if you can make it that far. It's opened by the seventh seal. Watch this silence in heaven. Now, believe it or not, one Bible teacher said that that's his justification as to why women will not be in heaven. <laughs> now, either men, you're brave as a married man who laughed at that, or you're single, which might explain why you're still single. <laughs> I didn't say he did, right? No, that's not what's going on. Really, what I believe is what's going on here is silence for a half an hour. See, you just finished all the seals and you thought that was bad? It's basically God's way of saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. And the reason why it's silence is because I grew up in Kansas and Nebraska, Tornado Alley. Dealt with tornadoes a lot, several of them at a time. And there's always a weird thing that happens right before the tornado hits with its complete ferocity. Right? And, it's just, and all of a sudden, it's just... And the sky's all yellow and green, ugly brown, boiling, that stuff. Like that. And mom's screaming, get in the cellar. Me and my brother, what are we doing? We're outside. Oh, so it's, it didn't work well with our family dynamic. But anyway, so we're out there. And then all of a sudden, right before it hit, total silence. I mean, there's not even a cricket, not a bird chirp, nothing. Complete silence. And then, bang! And so after all what we just saw with the sealed judgments, God says, for not just... 30 seconds before a tornado hits, 30 minutes, nothing. You can't hear nothing on the planet. And I believe it's God's basically foreboding sign. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now we get into the great tribulation. It's going to be way bad. And here comes the first trumpet, of hail and fire. One third of the earth and the trees and all the green grasses burned up. And then the second trumpet, you got a huge asteroid. One third of the sea dies. One third of the ships are destroyed because of the giant tsunami on all the coastlines. The third trumpet, a blazing comet. One third of the rivers and fresh water are bitter. Many people die. Uh, the fourth one, the solar is mighty. One third of the sun, the moon, and the stars are struck. One third of the day and night is without light. That's going to completely disrupt uh, communications. Uh, fifth one, Satan releases is a demon horde of locusts. The people who took the mark in the seven-year tribulation, uh, they're going to be tortured for five months nonstop. It's just a horrible thing. In fact, it says it's so bad they want to die, but God doesn't allow them to die. Death eludes them. The sixth trump, the four angels are loose from Euphrates, kills one-fourth or one-third of mankind. Already one-fourth of the population. By the way, one-fourth in the sealed judgments. If that were to happen today, that's about two billion people. And then here comes another third. <laughs> All in one uh, fell swoop there, as we see there. Then, hey, you are still got a lot to go. you got the bowl judgments towards the back end there. The first bowl, you got the ugly, painful sores on receivers of the mark. you got the second bowl, all the sea, not just the third, but all the sea turns to blood. All the sea creatures die. How many guys realize that the ocean's big? Praise God, all two of you. Which is a weird response, especially when you guys living in Hawaii. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Do you realize as big as the ocean is, we just see the top of it? Can you imagine when all the sea creatures die? All the way even down to the bottom. Can you imagine the stench from that? That's what's going to happen. Right? 
right? And then it's just, you're still getting going. The third one, all the rivers and fresh water turn to blood. There's no fresh water on the planet. And then God turns up the heat. Sun scorches people with fire and people curse God. The fifth bowl, the kingdom of the Antichrist is plunged into darkness. And the sixth bowl, the river Euphrates dries up to prepare the way for the kings of the east for the battle of Armageddon. Uh, that's done. The whole planet's duped by three evil frog-like spirits to deceive the world. And that's from the, out of the mouth of Satan, out of the Antichrist, and out of the false prophet. I mean the Pope. I mean the false prophet. The seventh bowl, uh, hey, if he's not the false false prophet. He's trying to get the job. That's my theory. But anyway, that's right. Uh, we don't know. But anyway, the seventh bowl, hey, this is it. It is done. This is at the very back end. Watch this. The greatest of all earthquakes, even bigger than the one I just described earlier in the seals. A new look for Jerusalem. It's split into three, prepares it for the millennium. All the cities, how many? All the cities on, the, how many cities are on the planet? Every single one's going to collapse. Every single one of them. A cup of wrath is poured out for Babylon. All mountains and islands of what? Last time it was all mountains and islands of what are shaken. This one what? You can't even find them. You can't find an island. You can't find a mountain. That's how big this earthquake is, right? It's a massive hailstorm. Then on top of that, 100 pounds each, right? A, 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 a hailstorm, a hail ball about uh, the size of a football is two pounds. That's 100 pounds. How big are those guys slamming to the earth? And then here comes the battle of Armageddon, right? Satan dupes the, uh, the survivors at this point to try to take on God. That's the dumbest thing you can ever do. Blood is high as horses bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's four feet deep for 200 miles. It's a bloodbath. God doesn't lose. The angel harvest of the righteous, God scoops up the one-third remnant of the Jewish people and any Gentiles that are still alive at this point who got saved during the seven-year tribulation. Probably not a whole bunch, but, but they, they scoop them up. And, and they, guess what? The angel harvest of the unrighteous. I like to tell this to those people. I, I'm out there. You know, I'm, I don't need Jesus. I'm the ultimate survivor. I've been watching all those nature shows. And I got that Jeep with that muffler on top. I can go through water and still survive. And I've been storing up all this gear. I don't care. I've spent $500 million. And I got this deep underground bunker and you can't get me. And what? Listen, the Bible says, listen, even if somehow you can make it all the way to the back end of the seven-year tribulation, somehow still alive, and you still have not received Christ as your Savior, the angels are going to scoop you up. That's what he's talking about. And throw you straight into hell. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. <laughs> Do you see how bankrupt that is to put the church in there? I don't care if it's halfway, three quarters, all the way. That's nuts. But that's what's going on. And that's the point for, listen, if you're here today and you're not saved, what in the world are you waiting for? Because it could happen today. Bang, we're out of here. You're sitting there and that's going to begin on you. Why would you resist? Why would you? you hesitate that's the purpose for you now let's take a look at the purpose of the rapture for the christian right we know we're going we know we're not going in the seven year tribulation we leave prior but why does god tell us this in advance well let's take a look at that the first one is to comfort the living about the dead and this is why god uh, paul uh, wrote the first thessalonians right was because they had some questions right they've been saved for a while right jesus hadn't come back right and and some christians their fellow christians have died and so they begin to wonder wait wait a second you know what, what's going to happen with those guys they already died uh are they going to get resurrected like we get resurrected or are, they, are we going to get to see them again or you know what and so that's why paul wrote this passage that we open up with with that in mind he's comforted the living about the christians who'd already died and gone on watch this first thessalonians 4 13 through 18 brothers we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or die or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope we believe that Jesus died and rose again. We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will not, uh, certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep or die. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up, harpazo, rapture, rapture, quick snatching, catching away, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, what? Again, encourage each other with these words. So this is the order of events, right? And this is kind of cool if you really get this. I know the rapture. No, no, let me, let me, let me explain it to you. First, the order of events is Jesus Christ is going to come down from heaven with the souls who fall asleep, the Christians who've already died, with him. The second thing that's going to happen is those who've already died in Christ Okay, they're going to get their resurrected bodies first, right? And then third, hard on their heels, if you will, we who are still alive at that moment, we get ours hard on their heels right at, uh, after they get theirs, and we meet together with the Lord in heaven, which means, think about this, Christian. If the rapture were to happen in our lifetime, and it's looking 
pretty good. It could even happen again today. It's imminent. But do you realize, think of all the Christians that you've known that's, that's already died. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. They went straight to be of Jesus. But think about all the loved ones. It could be a spouse, could be a child, just or a fellow congregant, somebody you've known, right? And, and, and do you realize you're not just going to see them again in heaven? Watch this. You're going to see them in the rapture. Do you get it? Isn't that awesome? Hey, Bob, how you doing? I haven't seen you. How was heaven? I'm going back with you. Isn't that awesome? Right? So that's why Paul's saying, listen, don't worry about your loved ones. Right? That's why he wrote the primary rapture passage. They're okay. In fact, they're going to get a resurrected body too, just like you. And guess what? You're going to get to see them in the rapture on the way to heaven. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing, he's comforting not just the living about the, the Christians who have died, but he's comforting them about this day of the Lord thing. Now, if you take a look at this time frame called the day of the Lord, it's mentioned in the Old and New Testament, you see that it cannot and does not have anything to do with the church. And I'll get to that in a second. But the day of the Lord is not talking about a specific day, like a 24-hour literal period. It's a period of time that starts at the seven-year tribulation and moves forward. How do I know that? Because Old and New Testament tells us that the day of the Lord is not just a day of darkness and gloominess. It specifically says it's a day of God's wrath, right? And God's wrath starts at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation and moves forward. So the day of the Lord starts at the seven-year tribulation and moves forward because it's a day of God's wrath. Do you get it? That's just basic Bible uh, common sense interpretation. So therefore, since the day of the Lord involves God's wrath, that means you and I can't be a part of it, right? Now, I didn't say that. God did. At least three different times, right? Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, Jesus, of course, how much more shall we be saved from God's what? Wrath through him. And then before the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, and after, Paul says it twice, before and after the rapture. Watch this. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath, the seven-year tribulation, right? And then he talks about the, pa uh, the rapture, and then he says it again, after the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 5.9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I, the Christian, cannot be a part of this day of the Lord thing that involves God's wrath because the scripture is very clear. We are saved from, rescued from, not appointed unto God's wrath. And it was this lie that we actually have, believe it or not, 2 Thessalonians, right? And I love it because in the passage, it's almost like Paul's going like, hello, McFly, we've already gotten over this. But some false teachers, listen, tell me this is not applicable for today. False teachers have come in after he'd been there. He wrote 1 Thessalonians, tell him about the rapture, right? And then false teachers came in and says, you're going to be in the day of the Lord, i.e. the seven-year tribulation. And they started to freak out. Does that sound like people today? Yeah, they say we're going to be in there, right? And Paul corrects them. In fact, here's what he says about that. Let's analyze that, right? 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 5. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, i.e. the rapture, let's tear it apart, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy or report or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that what? The day of the Lord has already come, i.e. you're in the seven-year tribulation, right? What's Paul say? Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. You're not going to be in there, right? For that day, not the rapture, the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed. When is he revealed? Daniel 9, 27. When he makes that covenant with the people of Israel, that's what starts this final week of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. That's why it's a seven-year tribulation. It's that final week. It's not a five-year tribulation, a two-year, 118. It's, that's it. And so that happens. And then he's the Antichrist. He gets revealed after we're out of here. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that's called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That's the halfway point now. Uh, the abomination of desolation. And I love this. McFly, hello. Don't you remember when I, that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? You can hear Paul. They're like, I can't believe I'm going. Why, why are you listening to these false teachers? What's the context? Why are you? Let, don't let anybody decide. You, I can't believe you even entertain the thought that you're going to be in the seven-year tribulation. And yet, what do we have today? People saying you're going to be there mid-trib, half the way, pre-wrath from our timetable, three-fourths of the way, post-trib all the way. Don't let anyone deceive you. We're not going to spend one nanosecond in that. Why? Because the Bible says we are saved from, rescued from, not appointed unto God's wrath. 
And can I tell you something? Jesus Christ is not a wife beater. He doesn't beat his bride up before he comes and gets her. Right? Now, let's remind the last thing. All right? So that's why, so why is the purpose of the rapture? To remind us it's okay to comfort the living about the dead. Our Christian loved ones are going to be fine. We're going to see them in the rapture. The second thing is, listen, you're not going to be in the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation. All right? Don't let anybody deceive you. That's why it's encourage one another these words. It's good news. And the third one is this, is to remind us of our current life here on earth. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but did you know that God saved you for a purpose? Praise God, all none of you. Right? I'm glad you're here. We're going to correct that for you. Right? He did. Now, I didn't say that. God prepared each Christian to do something absolutely fantastic. And this is amazing. Right? We read Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right? Keep reading. What's the scripture say? Ephesians 2, 10. For those of you hooked on chronology, right? It says this. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Right? We're not saved by works, but he saves us in spite of works, not of works, to do good works. You get that? We're going to the Holy Spirit. He begins to do something through you. Okay, what a concept. Which God prepared, listen, in advance for us to do. So each one of us is saved for a purpose, right? And you're sitting there, oh, Pastor Billy, if I only knew what God called me to do. I just, uh, I've, been, I've been praying and fasting for 15 years. I, in fact, I even went to that prayer and fasting conference with meals included. I still didn't get a word from God. I, are you kidding me? It's not that hard to figure out. Right? I get it. You're probably talking about specifics. What's that specific giftedness? Well, you got to try, do something. Get out of the driveway, okay? Uh, but there's so much of God's known, revealed will to keep you busy every day, right? You don't have to pray. There's lots to do, right? And one of them is called the Grand Suggestion. No, I mean the Great Commission. That's what it is, right? Yeah, well, that's, that is what it is, but that's how we treat it as a as suggestion. No, this will keep you busy every day. Matthew 28, the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended to the right hand of the Father which is where we're going at the rapture, right? Jesus said and came to them. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and crank up the numbers. Build the biggest building you can and get as many people in there and cram them in there. And, and go light and don't teach the Bible and just be happy and chevy. Learn to be a better you. Build up your financial self-esteem. And... He didn't say that. What did he say? Disciples. You know what disciples is? It's methetes in the Greek where we get the word mathematics. It means disciplined learner. You get out there and you preach the word of God. And you tell people about Jesus Christ. You don't just, when people get saved, they need to be discipled. Right? right so he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, and, and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded to you. Again, this is the great commission, not the grand suggestion. Unfortunately, we treat it like that. And believe it or not, the reason why God wants us to do that is because we're out there sharing the good news of the gospel. Did you know, newsflash, newsflash, did you know that God wants other people besides us to be saved? What? I can't take all these truths in one day. Are you serious? Yeah, he really does, right? He's not willing that any should perish, right? He wants other people to be saved. Aren't you glad that somebody should witness to you? Then do in like kind. You get out there with the bad news. I mean, the good news, right? Well, it's, it's the good news. All right, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed. It's the best news ever, man. Right? But we get out there, we share the good news, right? And the reason why is because we're waiting, tie this back into the rapture, we're waiting for that moment called the fullness of Gentiles. Right? When that last Gentile gets saved, then only God knows we're out of here, folks. Right? And then God's uh, a viewpoint goes back on Israel, who is going to be in the seven-year tribulation. God uses the seven-year tribulation as a, a discipline rod, if you will, to save one-third remnant of Israel. He's not done with Israel. Right? But we're here until that fullness of Gentiles, and then God's Eyes go back on Israel. Romans 11, Paul talks about this, 25 through 26. I don't want you to be ignorant of this, brothers, this mystery, brothers, so that you become what? Conceited. As if you're the only one that needs to be saved. Israel is experiencing a hardening in what? Part, not in full. Until when? Until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. Right? So we're out there with the Great Commission, the gospel, the good news. We're out there awaiting the rapture. We're out there sharing it with as many people as we can. And wouldn't that be the coolest way to go? I don't know who that last person is. God does. Who's that last non-Jewish person? That if, you, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Welcome to the club. Okay, and so who is that last person? I don't know. But isn't that the way to go? Wouldn't it be cool? Because it's going to happen to somebody. Right? Right? And it's way better than that golden Willy Wonka ticket thing. Right? But think about this. This is really going to happen. And, and maybe it's somebody here today. Maybe it's one of you. Being an obedient Christian, sharing the good news of the gospel as you wait the rapture. And here you are. You witness somebody. Maybe it's today. And, you, and you're, you're praying with that, with that waiter or waitress there because they, they said, yes, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. And they're that last one. 
right? And you both got your eyes closed, and you say, in Jesus' name, boom, you're out of here. Isn't that the way to go? It's going to happen. We need to get out there and share the gospel. Now, the second thing, as we're sharing the gospel, again, you're saying, what do we do in the meantime as we await the rapture? Okay, yeah, our loved ones are fine the, who passed on. We're going to see them again in the rapture. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to be in the seven-year tribulation. That's good news. Okay, I'm out there sharing the gospel, but what? I'm backing it up with a holy life. And I think oftentimes we miss this, right? First Peter 1.15, but just as he, God, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Why? Because it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, the reason why, God, you and I, again, we're not saved by our works, but we're out there right? Emulating, we're walking, living, speaking, acting, behaving like Jesus, right? Okay. And that's a positive witness, right? Right. Because if you and I don't take sin serious, then why should the lost, right? No, we're, we're not, we don't, we don't become sinless, but as we grow in maturity out of love for Jesus Christ, after we get saved by the power of the Holy Spirit, he begins to change it from the inside out. And so hopefully as you mature, you start to sin less, i.e. your life becomes more holy, like him. And why is that needed? Because the lost need to know that sin is serious. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is why there's a seven-year tribulation in the first place that God's going to pour out his wrath. And if we don't take it serious, why should they? Sin is at the very beginning of receiving the gospel. God, I am a what? Sinner. I need a savior, right? You need to admit that. That's the first step. But if we don't take sin serious, why should they? They're not stupid. We need to share the gospel, yes, but we back it up by the power of God's Holy Spirit with a holy life so they get the clear message that sin needs to be dealt with really fast because you don't want to be left behind and you certainly don't want to end up in hell. And hell, folks, is one place you don't ever want to be. In fact, let's remind ourselves real quick, what is that place like, right? Because somebody refused to take sin serious and asked Jesus to forgive them of it. Let's take a look real quick. Contrary to the father of lies, though, God's word describes hell as a place where God pours out his wrath upon the wicked. God's word declares, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who rendered every man according to his deeds. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. God's word speaks of a certain terrifying expectation of judgment and of raging fire which consumes the enemies of God. Severe punishment, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Will hell be a good time? Contrary to the father of lies, hell will not be a place of friendship and rock music, but of misery and darkness and isolation. The only thing you will hear from others are their cries of torment. Jesus Christ warned, the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible speaks of the wicked for whom the black darkness has been reserved. Contrary to Sting's video, God's word declares that there is no rest for the wicked in hell. The book of Revelation states, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Jesus said of the day of judgment, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. God's word says, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord. Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Forever and ever and ever and ever, and it doesn't stop. 
when you don't take sin serious and when you don't ask Jesus Christ to forgive you and trust in His death on the cross, the Bible says you confess Him as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him to the great. You'll be, if you don't do that, then to hell you will go. So whether it's hell for all eternity or hell for seven years, nonstop, basically on earth, how many of you guys would say that would be one of the most loving things for us as Christians to do is to tell them there's a way out. His name is Jesus. Why do we hesitate? But again, we back it up with our lives because if we don't take sin seriously, why should they? And that's the first step you need to admit in getting saved and rescuing from hell and hell on earth. Amen? And you go, well, Pastor Billy, that's nifty and convenient how that all worked out with the rapture we're supposed to be. No! I didn't say this. This is the two things that will keep you busy every day as we await the rapture. I didn't say God did. This is exactly what we're supposed to do. Get the gospel out and be a godly example, right? Paul said it to Titus, specifically awaiting the rapture. Here's what he said. For the grace of God, not by works, remember? Praise God. Am I glad that you're not saved by your works? Right? For by the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Anybody can get saved, no matter how far you've gone, what you've done, right? It teaches us to what? When you get saved? No to what? Ungodliness and worldly passions and to what? Live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, right? You back it up. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing as we what? We wait for the blessed hope, the rapture, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Pastor Bill, I don't know what God's called me to do. I'm still waiting. On Maybe I should dig or elder, stack chairs. I don't know, teach that. Oh, listen! Share the gospel. And back it up with the holy life by the power of God's Spirit. Lead as many souls as you can to Christ. That'll keep you busy. As He leads you, yes, to that specific. We just need to get back to that. And so again, as we close, listen, if you're not saved, what in the world are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The Bible says in Luke 16, Jesus talking about hell. He talked about the person in hell. And he says, they will remember. Right? It says it right there. Do you realize that people in hell will remember every opportunity maybe even this day, when they could have escaped that place. But out of embarrassment, out of pride, out of self-righteousness, whatever it is, you still didn't take Jesus up on his offer to forgive you. You will remember. But it's too late. That's why the Bible says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's that? Oh, no! Why? Did I not turn to Jesus? Oh! And it never stops. And so I beg you now, while there's still breath, turn to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you. Get saved today. And for the Christian, I, I, Pastor Bill, I don't know who I'm supposed to witness to. Are you serious? I'm going to teach you a scientific method. Guaranteed, 100%, works every single time. How do you know you witness to somebody? Right? Here's what you do. You put your hand over their mouth, and if you feel air, you witness to them. <laughs> While they're still alive, you don't quit. I don't care if you share it a hundred times, they reject it. A hundred, share it again. You're looking at the biggest skeptic there ever was. And I'm so glad that people put up with my nastiness. And I was mean and nasty to them. And they kept telling me about Jesus. Don't quit. And that's the purpose for us. If you're not saved, you need to get saved. If you are saved, there's nothing more important than getting that gospel out and frankly, saving as many as you can because this garbage can that we call planet Earth is going up big time. And there's only one way out and that's through Jesus Christ. Save as many as you can. If you're not saved, you need to get saved right now. If you are, remember, all born again Christians go in the rapture. But Jesus is going to find you doing something. Are you ready by every day? That's your heart. Use me, God, in spite of me. Cause this life to be a holy example. Use these lips to declare the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because all I can think about is saving as many as I can. That's how you know you're ready. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you. And again, God, if there's anybody still after all this that's still not saved, if they're here and they're unsaved, please save them now by the power of your spirit. And God, we your church. If we're off track, and we live in this uh, wicked candy world with all these things to distract us. And sometimes we can get off track. And God, we just uh, pray that if there's anybody here today that needs to be uh, encouraged to get back on track with you, that also by your spirit, you would do that. Correct them and that they would finish strong. Thank you that we're not saved by our works, but you prepared good works for us in advance to do. We don't get to witness in heaven. It only happens here. We don't get to store up treasure in heaven. That only happens here. The enemy can't take away our salvation, but he can take away our time. Please, God, help us to be faithful and wise with what little time we have left. May you find us faithful. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.